Uh, so the title of this presentation is Sign Signs Everywhere Sign. Uh, that's a reference to the Five Man Electrical Band, which happens to be, you know, a fantastic Canadian dad rock band. Um, if you're not familiar, check them out. Uh, and, and Todd Conklin taught me about chaos engineering. Um, so a little bit more about me. Um, I contribute a chapter to the O'Reilly Chaos Engineering book. It's titled Humanistic Chaos. Uh, and this talk is really based um, on a subsection of that talk or that chapter around signals uh, and, and what to do about signals, how to, how to understand them, how to find them uh, and all that. Um, the song uh, uh, Signs by Five Man Electrical Band really uh, sort of spawned the, the, the premise for this talk for me. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the song actually was a B-side um, when it was first released, but it actually became their biggest hit. Um, and so then they re-released it. So they learned something from releasing it as a B-side and then re-released it as an A-side, um, which I think is a pretty good uh, sort of example of, of what happens when you, when you see the signs. Um, so signs are all around us. Um, they're, they're in everything we do. Um, they tell us a lot of things about the, the environment we live in. Um, and not all of those things are useful. Uh, sometimes they're like oddly specific uh, and they just like impact, they have unintended impacts about how much you want a lollipop, um, like right now. Um, other times uh, they give clear warnings without much detail or context of why, um, but effective nonetheless. Um, I'd imagine you're not going to feed the elephants. Um, Sometimes they evolve over time and are a representation of the environment. Um, so they're susceptible to change. Um, and they, the impact that they have evolves along with those, uh, the way that they, they change. Um, signals, on the other hand, are more dynamic. Um, so signs are very flat and static. Signals are very dynamic um, in nature. And, and they serve a similar purpose to, to help you understand your environment. Um, and even signs can give off signals. Um, so an active railroad crossing will give you a signal that you should pay attention to what you're about to do, um, even though it might not give you as much signal as a flashing a railroad crossing sign. Um, it's, a, it's a weaker signal. So the main difference between a sign and a signal is that a sign is a is semiotic concept, a, a, a symbol, right, uh, whose presence or occurrence indicates the probable presence or occurrence of something else, um, right? So they always represent their, that there's something else going on. And a signal is, is a very varying physical quantity that conveys information. So a signal's purpose is to give you information, which is a little bit different than uh, just the, the, the presence of a sign saying that there's something there. Okay. So the section in my chapter is about weak signals. Um, so we, we understand signs. Uh, they're a natural way to give us notice. We understand signal. It's a more dynamic way to convey information. So what, what is a weak signal? And this is where Todd Conklin comes into the, into the chat. Um, so weak signals are weak indicators that tell us when there's a problem happening not when a problem has happened. You'll never hear a weak signal in failure. A signal in failure is loud. And that, that's from a, a safety moment uh, in Todd Conklin's Pre-Accident Investigations podcast. Great podcast. I've been listening to it for the better part of a decade. It's been around for a long time and it's, it's, it's still great today. Um, his safety moments are like two, three minutes and they're just full of wisdom. Um, really, really great. Uh, he's a safety professional. Um, so a more technical definition, um, this comes from uh, an ANSP safety performance uh, white paper uh, that David Woods and Richard Cook wrote, um, is a seemingly random or disconnected piece of information that at first appears to be background noise, but can be recognized as part of a significant pattern by viewing it through a different frame or connecting it with other pieces of information. So it's only weak in the sense that you haven't figured out what it means yet, right? And you, you see it, you, you have some, some relevance, uh, some understanding that it's there, but you haven't connected it to anything yet. Um, it, it requires more context. Okay, so why, why should I care about weak signals? Um, you might have noticed on that previous slide 
uh, the, the, pay, the paper that I reference uh, mentions creating foresight. Um, it talks about future threats. Um, I, I have to assume you're here because you understand why that might be an interesting concept. Um, so this is a sort of uh, what I'll call famous uh, uh, diagram that, that floats around the both chaos engineering and uh, human uh, or learning from incidents in software space. Um, it's sort of a meme. Uh, this is the Rasmussen's dy dynamic safety model. Um, and what it's trying to say is that there are forces pushing back and forth that really determine whether something has fallen into failure, is about to fall into failure, or perhaps even is moving further away from a state of failure. Um, you know, weak, weak signals are indications that, that something is going wrong, um, but it, it's also an indication that it hasn't actually hit that boundary yet, which is why it's interesting. Um, that boundary is often referred to as going solid. So it's a reference to a uh, nuclear power um, slang term about how in order to run uh, a, nucle a nuclear reactor, you need both steam and water uh, to maintain the an appropriate temperature for that reactor. And if the entire reactor fills with water, it has now gone solid and is in meltdown. Um, and that is not a good thing. Um, so, you know, it, it's that boundary that suddenly you've crossed that now you have a problem. Um, and so like one of the things that I really think chaos engineering is impactful for is searching for those boundaries. It's understanding how we can find things that are going, that could happen, that may happen before they actually happen. Um, and so this is a, this is sort of a reference to uh, uh, that, that, that chapter as well around Success and failure are really the same thing. There's nothing inherently different about them. They're just two sides of the same coin. Um, once what once was a success can become a failure in, in seconds. Um, and there was nothing about that uh, that 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 could have could have prevented it. It's just the nature of complex systems. So uh, you know, just as Adrian was describing this morning, our goal is to understand what the margin between those things are. Um, how far away are we? Uh, and can we intentionally search to understand that better? Um, you know, I, in the chapter, I focus on organizational systems um, because I think they're interesting. I'm a manager. Uh, and so like, I see a lot of the social side of the complex social technical system that we, we participate in as, as engineers, as uh, people in technology. Um, and so like, there's just very interesting pieces that, that come together in, in that sort of organizational systems. Um, so the next part of this talk, I'm just going to try and give you an example of what I'm talking about. So what are these signals in the wild that we're looking at? Um, so uh, these come from, from Todd Conklin directly. So in that safety moment, he talks about doors that open backwards. He talks about a stoplight that isn't timed long enough for you to walk across the street. Um, he talks about a buffet line that's out of order, which I think is the best example. Uh, you know, if you put the tortillas at the end of the line and you're trying to make a taco, it's not going to work out very well. Um, you know, the door that opens backwards, my mind immediately goes to uh, uh, Norman's Norman door. Uh, that is the door handle that you're not really sure whether you're supposed to pull or push uh, because it's just a bar that goes like this. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, you user experience folks who are focused on what signals the software we create are, are telling the users. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that those signals are everywhere in everything, uh, and, and they help us understand our systems. Um, so here's an example, a very loud signal. Um, so this is from a presentation I gave uh, at reInvent several years ago now around a, an epic failure we had with Elasticsearch. Um, so it's it's highlighting how many. So I don't if, if you're familiar with Elasticsearch, uh, the idea of pending tasks may, may be giving you some feels right now. Um, there were a lot of them, and and so the thing about Elasticsearch is that there are specific tasks that can only run on 
the 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 main the primary uh, server, and that's where these tasks run. And so when you're in a situation where you have lots of pending tasks, the only way out of it is through, uh, and there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, it also points out that things went yellow and red and and very very scary. Um, you can ask me for that talk, talk later if you want to know more about what, what unfolded. Um, sometimes signs give off signals. Um, they can be super morbid and make you feel a little uncomfortable. Like how, what happens that they needed to put this sign up? Um, like why was it super important that they told you that there are signal, there's a signal timings experiment going on? And then also like, I'm not sure how I feel about partaking in a signal timing experiment, like as a, as a frequent pedestrian, like I want to know that I'm not going to have issues with crossing the street. Um, like I think it would tell you a totally different signal if you knew how many pedestrian cas casualties had happened at this intersection. <laughs> um, uh, this next one is, is really, uh, it's a simple one. It's a simple one in that it's a sort of a routine, mundane situation. Um, this actually happened last week. Um, we have an internal deployment system that runs. It's a Rails app. Um, it started yelling at me because I was on call. And I was trying to figure out why it was yelling at me. Um, and sometimes when, when something yells at you, um, and in this case, that's a fairly loud signal. But what I'm actually pointing at um, is something a little bit deeper that is a, is, a, is a weak signal for a bigger systemic issue, right? The thing that is in front of us can sometimes be loud about the specific context of that thing, but the deeper, broader, larger impacting situation um, can tell us more. So there's an issue with our deployment system that happened occasionally uh, where it would just all of a sudden go crazy. And we, we had not been able to pinpoint that it was deploying a specific service that was the reason that it was going wonky because our deployment system is doing hundreds of deploys on a given day. So like pinpointing it down to a specific deploy um, was, was not a realization that uh, we had made yet. Um, and it was seeing this edge case in this context that all of a sudden it was like, yep, that's actually what the problem is. Uh, and that, that's, an, that's an insight. So what I was getting to is that weak signals are a critical source of insights. Um, insights, as Gary Klein describes, um, are an unexpected shift in the way we understand things. Um, they're actually super, super important to the way that we as humans understand each other because an insight is a, is a, is a way we can describe something to someone else in a way that they maybe hadn't thought about it before because you hadn't thought about it before. And that narrative is super valuable. So insights, uh, see, this, this is, both of these quotes are from uh, Seeing What Others Don't, um, which is a fantastic book uh, that I recommend. Um, they, they come without warning. It's not something that we think is going to happen. And that is why it's unexpected. It feels like a gift and in fact it is. Huh. Sounds like chaos engineering's purpose to me. Um, you know, insights. So, so, the, so this next section is I'm going to give you a list of insights that came from weak signals. Some of these came directly from the, the book chapter. So I created this rule uh, four years ago. So I'm... I'm the manager of the platform operations team at Sports Engine. We are a you know, 24 seven on call team. Um, we had been ending on call rotations on Mondays, which is a very normal practice that lots of people do. Um, you hand off and start the next week, um, super normal. One day after a particularly tiring on call shift, I realized that it was it was kind of annoying to have to still be at work uh, for an entire week after just having been on call. Um, and, it, and it forced me to think about the problem, like how could we change it? And what we did was we just moved the handoff day to a Friday. So as an on-call person, you start your on-call shifts 
on a Friday and then you end on a Friday. And so what happens is you get this time to recharge whenever you complete it. And that had not like occurred to me until I had started to recognize the signal of, you know, I've noticed others were feeling tired on a Monday and it's like, this is not a good way to start your week. Um, we also sort of paired that with giving people half a day off as soon as their shift ended as well, because you should compensate on call. That's super important and don't forget it. So the other, another insight that we, uh, that, that I've come to realize, um, is that as a, as an operations team, we're frequently serving our customers, as I like to call them, which are the other engineers throughout the organization. Um, and, and operations historically is a very interrupt driven type of work. So what we ended up doing instead of just what we, well, what we realized is that we needed to figure out how to create a queue that then didn't impact the entire team anytime there was a problem. So we defined a system that we called ops support where we assign an engineer to basically be on call for that particular day to, to manage the and triage this incoming uh, ongoing work. And it was, you know, th those insights come from, you know, another day where it felt like two or three people lost a day because they were dealing with various different interrupt driven things. You don't notice that from a, a like failure standpoint, there's nothing wrong with working on interrupt driven work as a team, but like you start to notice the impact that it has and the second order things that are involved. So this one is actually one of my favorites. Um, and, and this is the, this is the literal signal. So I don't know anything about this. We'll need to talk to Emma. And as a, as a manager, this is a common thing that somebody would tell me. Uh, as an engineer, that's a common thing that someone would tell you. As an engineer, that's a common thing you would say to someone else. Uh, and what is what that signal is telling you is that there's a single point of failure. Quite frankly, is that if if the team if the team doesn't know about something, you're you're losing out on uh, all of the scary things that could happen if Emma no longer works for the company. Um, or you're, you're approaching a boundary where you may lose a huge amount of knowledge um, based on somebody going on vacation or, or whatever it happens to be. So the purpose of this talk is really just to point out that your system is signaling constantly. Finding that balance of what signal to act on versus continuing to monitor is truly the hard part. Like it's hard to know what you should do about that signal because you get them at they're everywhere they're, they're constant um and uh you know Nora jones says, says something really great about this uh it, it, when she talks about the before phase of chaos engineering and deciding what to experiment on is i think actually for me is the most interesting part of chaos engineering entirely um is it's it's deciding what part of your system you want to learn more about and, and what approach you want to take to do that experimentation. Um, if you aren't spending, and, and this, this comes directly from Nora, if you aren't spending at least as much time on the before phase as you are on the other parts of the, the chaos experiment, you're not doing it right. <laughs> like, I'm going to tell you that right now. You need to spend a significant amount of time deciding what and how to actually perform those experiments. Um, you just need to slow down and become an insight hunter. Um, because ultimately the value proposition of chaos engineering is the insights that you gain. That's it. <laughs>